So good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming to our Eastern Speed event, which Rhea have been kindly promoting for us. I'm Sophie Audridge Neal and I'm a business manager over in Anglia Route. And I'm going to be your host today. So I've been lucky enough to be involved in Speed first as a PM and then more recently in helping to roll it out across the region. So I am super excited today to share with you some of the things that we've been up to. So what is today all about? Whether you know a little bit about speed or whether you know or think you know really quite a lot about speed, I'm hoping that everyone learns something new today. That's absolutely our aim. But we really want to leave you inspired to go away and give it a go yourselves. We'd like you to be thinking about the differences that you can make as we go through today. And then at the end, to feel like you can go out and have a go. So I'm not going to run word for word through our agenda, but you can see that we've got a bumper line up covering speed across lots and lots of different parts of our organisation, or at least within Eastern, and also beyond into our supply chain and into DFT colleagues as well to find out what they've been up to a little bit more. So to help me, I have got some of our biggest speed gurus in Easton with me here today. These are people who are really trying to walk the talk and embed speed in all that we're up to. Before we kick off, though, I just wanted to draw your attention to how you can get involved. I'm not going to see if you've got your hands up or if you're jumping around, so um, Please have a look at the top right hand corner of your screen so you should see a message like symbol. Please use that and use that throughout the conference today to drop any questions that you might have for us. There's going to be quite a decent Q&A session towards the end of the event and we will be looking at those questions throughout and we try and pick up as many as we can in that space. So please don't be shy. We really, really do want to hear from you. Um, my one ask is there's an awful lot going on in the outside world at the moment and there's an awful lot going on in the industry, but today is about speed. So please keep those questions very speed focused. And if we don't get a chance to get round to them today, we will commit to taking them away and to replying to each and every question that does get posted. So. Without further ado, I will kick us off and hand over to Paul McEwen, our investment director, to tell you a little bit more about what we've been up to. And of course, just to tell you again why speed is so very, very important to our industry. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Sophie. Good <coughs> morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Paul McEwen, investment director for the Eastern Region. Um, myself and my team have uh, accountability for both the long term strategic planning, early development and ultimately sponsorship of many of the projects and programmes across the eastern region. And as Sophie uh, referred to just then, um, I'm going to take the opportunity of saying well, what has been happening over the last uh, 12 to 24 months of speed across the eastern region, a little bit about the context and that context is, is constantly changing. Um, again, as Sophie made reference to uh, things that are out, you know, the environment that we operate within. Um, but if I, I think if I just start, um, just remind ourselves that there has been significant progress and activities across both Network Rail, the department, and more, most importantly, the supply chain and our partners around um, embracing speed and really driving forward on a number of acti activities which we are really starting to see the impacts of those um, in, uh, in in the portfolio. Um, but it's um, it's quite in, important and clear for us that whilst we've made some progress that we you know we need significant more progress and momentum um, generating so that we can manage additional tailwinds uh, or headwinds even sorry um, that no doubt will you know, we'll, we will need to address over the coming months and years. Um, just before I touch a little bit around the background of the funding, I do want to just highlight um, what you will get today is a great opportunity um, from some of the um, participants around some really tangible examples of um, speed in practice and, and how it directly impacts both the cost and schedule 
of projects and programmes. Um, so I'm looking forward to both the middle and main line and the access for all um, agenda items later today. And I'll touch on a couple of specific um, projects um, where we have also seen and demonstrated improvements already. So the context is the industry uh, has and continues to have significant taxpayers funding through the government through the pandemic. Um, you know, we have seen um, a level of recovery, um, but clearly we still continue, continue to be a, a, a uh, have a requirement of funding from central government. What I should say, you know, in addition to the, the headline number that's on the screen of 12 billion, the government has continued to be significantly supported in, supportive in the investment uh, on capital investment into the rail infrastructure and industry. Uh, and we've got to continue to demonstrate progress on our efficiencies through the speed program um, as to why that, uh, you know, that, that, that faith and, and allocation of funding is necessary to continue. Um, if we just flick on to the next slide. So just to recap, um, people will no doubt recall the strap line half the time slash the cost. Um, others are 50% um, cheaper, 50% faster. Those are ambitious targets, um, but those are targets that we must continue to strive towards uh, and demonstrate progress um, across every single project in our in our remit in our portfolio, as well as driving that throughout the whole program. Um, we're seeing some real innovation um, to stretch ourselves collectively as a teams. Um, and those are actually in, in the eastern region are already translating to the identification of three billion of speed efficiencies um, that we are reporting, of which two billion are already now embedded into our project forecast estimates, which is a significant um, progress again that we've collectively made, but we've still got to a, translate the, the remaining one billion of efficiencies, but also then push forward and identify further. Um, if we just move on to the next slide, please. So, what are we all being collectively doing? Um, you you will have through previous speed weeks been no doubt had the opportunity um, to be briefed on uh, a number of themes um, that were identified um, on a national basis. Had individual sponsors and small teams that really scoped out. Um, how these areas were affecting the, uh, the time and cost effectiveness of delivering projects. Um, I'm, I myself was a sponsor of the One Team Culture, so we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, but these themes and the outputs that they have achieved so far, it is really up to us to grab hold of those and then bring them forward and utilize them in our projects, in our programs, in our portfolio. This is not a centralized uh, national initiative of top down to be done to us. It's our opportunity to grab these tools, skill sets, mindsets, opportunities and really um, adapt them, utilize them as appropriate for our individual projects and, and programs. If we just move on to the next slide, please. So one of those was one team. Um, it's critical that we identified one of the uh, areas of opportunities of improvement was a, a, a clear opportunity to identify uh, a one team approach um, to eliminate any any apparent lack of trusts, any disconnections between unclear or grey uh, accountabilities and really focus on what was the critical uh, success criteria in delivering uh, projects to their cost and schedules and, and really removing indecision or as much indecision in decisive decision making throughout the cycle at all levels of our organisations. Um, the team that led on this um, had a number of workshops, worked with individual projects, worked with um, suppliers, worked with TOC partners, worked with the department and across Network Rail and identified actually um, this isn't rocket science, <laughs> thankfully, uh, for me as a sponsor of it, um, but actually they created a exercise book, a toolkit, which really was just to facilitate teams getting together, working through not just the very practical, tangible aspects of a project of we want to achieve 
a journey to our improvement or better passenger experience at a station or whatever is the actual outcome, but actually what are the softer aspects of ensuring that clear accountability working to people's people and organisational strengths? Um, and I would urge you all, if you haven't either heard of one team or you're, you haven't seen any of the material being used on a project that you're involved with, ask the question, ask the questions to either it's the sponsor or the project manager in Network Rail, why not? And actually be quite in, insistent that that is something that, you know, you'd like to participate, you know, and see how that actually can just create some more unified um, uh, alignment, accountabilities and respect of each other and trust. So, uh, you know, one first takeaway for me is please, if it's not being used in your projects, you know, take that opportunity and, and um, ask why not. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So I thought I would take the opportunity across the portfolio to just to give a little insight to um, a few examples where, you know, we see differences in ways of working, um, challenges to the status quo of the of historical um, approaches is really starting to drive small or significant improvements in cost and schedule. So the first one is Darlington, um, a joint uh, working with Tees Valley uh, Combined Authority and Darlington Station, uh, Darlington Council. Um, the council themselves are uh, leading on the development and delivery of the public realm and new multi-storey car park adjacent to the existing station. And Network Rail will be put, you know, will be leading on the rail systems, additional platforms, and connections of the um, the new entrance and multi-storey car park to the um, to the existing uh, listed station. Now, speed. What? What? How has it affected um, the um, the project? One of the very tangible areas is just that challenge to standards. So the council have come forward with their designers with an alternative lift uh, specification. Historically uh, and initially that was challenged by Network Rail, good old standards, um, but through collaborative working, um, an alternative lower cost um, lift specification has been agreed for the multi-storey car park um, specification and also now a continued agreement to then take that forward to the rest of the estate to see whether that same approach can be taken um, with other interventions. So a great early uh, example of you know, working with non-rail partners in a speed approach. Can we move on to the next slide, please? White Rose. White Rose is a new station um, just west of Leeds on the Transpennine line. Um, this is a combination of both public and private sector investment into a new station adjacent to the White Rose um, uh, retail and commercial uh, location. Uh, again, just taking a different approach. We've challenged some of the, in a controlled manner, um, overlapping, which we to a degree have always been able to overlap old grip stages, um, but under the new ES, um, taking areas where it has been clearly defined it is mature sufficiently to move to the next stage and doesn't um, jeopardize the wider project we move forward to certain elements so that we actually um, the actual third party provide third party investors contractor who's building this station progressed and actually mobilized on site and, and was able to carry out early um, stabilization and piling on the embankment as so this is an elevated railway with the station as you can see in the picture from below and that has generated um, both cost and uh, and time saving for this new new station which is a another great example Can move on to the next one please Northumberland line I'm assuming the majority if not everyone will know about the restoring your railways and particularly the Northumberland line um, one of our uh, early adopters of uh, the approach of speed, looking at um, again working in partnership with Northumberland County Council and their and their design and delivery partners, uh, and ourselves, Network Rail and our supply chain, we identified that there was what I would term term terminate term, start again. I would define use a different word um, as no regrets investments where we actually accelerated with the support of the department and that you know again took a different approach to get through uh, a governance and approval of the funding 
where we accelerated the track renewals and hence the pictures there of, of uh, tra new track embed, embedded. So we've already delivered significant, I think about over 11,000 yards of track has already now been renewed in advance of the, the main mobilization and construction of the new stations um, that will enable the reintroduction of um, passenger services. That approach is also, um, we've taken that forward to, you know, looking at the maturity again of the different stages of um, the assets maturity and enable us to take a slightly different approach around the contingency as we went forward with business cases and funding requests uh, and generated another 14 million of efficiencies through that. And finally, probably the biggest, um, and it may come up certainly later, um, the biggest uh, benefit of, no thank you for staying with me, um, the North London line is the Transport and Works Act approach. So the, the uh, one of the national themes was looking at Transports and Works Act, the process, the resources associated with both within Network Rail and the department, um, and identifying target response timescales. And um, delighted to say that last week we successfully you know, jointly received the Transport and Works Act uh, consent to enable um, the construction of stations and the necessary consents for works. Uh, remaining rail infrastructure works and that was within the um, three month um, timescales for a decision from the close of the public inquiry. Um, some smaller schemes, smaller schemes, but within <clears throat> context, Can we move on to the next slide, please. Is, uh, sorry, we skipped news, have we skipped stations? That's OK. Um, so it's it's not just about big corridor um, projects. Um, it's relevant to all our projects and whilst we've picked major stations here uh, of Liverpool Street and um, Stratford, we have a number of fairly small size passenger um, safety and efficiency or flow, pet flow um, projects at these stations that again we've taken the approach of speed, um, adapting pace um, and really accelerated through the joint development but also the joint governance with the industry and the department colleagues uh, and move these into the design and delivery stage much, much faster than I think historically um, the industry and network rail would have taken. So it's at all scales the opportunities are with us. We move on to the final thing example. Back one to Cambridge, please. So Cambridge South, new, well, we call it a new station, but it's actually new infrastructure that includes a new station. Um, so I wouldn't like anyone to take the headline AFCs away from this um, this slide and think that's what we think is a, a an efficient speed cost of a new station. Um, think more of 10 million for a station and when we work upwards from there. Um, this is some significant infrastructure on a, um, a busy corridor south of Bedford to facilitate, um, yes, the, the, um, the introduction of a new station and the wider master planning that has with the south, with the city in the south. Um, aspects of the development there. But this was a project, just look at the scale of, I would say, somewhat quite traditional value engineering, challenging um, uh, requirements um, between 2018, um, 19 to early 2020. Um, great result, significant reduction in the AFC, but just also look, even after that, the scale of opportunity that the teams involved with Cambridge South were able to identify and actually then um, embed through an assured manner into the revised cost and schedule. So we've got the cost in improvement here, but there's also a significant improvement in the schedule. Um, and this probably is, I think from an Eastern uh, perspective, one of our flagship uh, projects that we will continue to make reference to around with the right focus, support and can do approach. Um, projects can really demonstrate significant improvements, maybe not quite 50%, um, but significant ambitious improvements in their uh, cost and schedule programs. And then move on, please. I also wanted just to touch on and say it's not just about um, traditional projects and sponsors and project managers. Um, in the wider context of my team, speed, you know, some of my team have grabbed this in the long term strategic planning. I just highlight there that, you know, the status quo approach for doing strategic planning of a corridor was up to three years of a cycle, very, um, very intensive, very labour 
uh, intensives as well, not just within Network Rail, but all our industry partners. Um, but taking different approaches as is that product and approach still the right thing to do? Um, we've seen significant movements over the last two, three years to you know different, more nimble approaches straight to the point that within a matter of months, the, the Peterborough Area Strategic Advice, which was specific around ensuring that we could work with the council and the combined authority around the master planning of the wider Peterborough area, has really given us um, the, the specific products and outputs we needed versus having a very detailed strategic study um, that is useful but wasn't required at this stage for this particular area. So it's really just to for those um, uh, that aren't directly involved per se with projects, um, it's, it's think about this is it's every process or activity in your organization or across our organizations, there are opportunities to extract um, efficiencies in both the cost and schedule. And then I think our final slide for me is just also just to recognize um, that this is not something we do alone. It is critical that we recognize how we work together, how we collaborate and, all, and also how we recognize the success of what we've achieved so far, as well as reminding ourselves right to the beginning that there is context of um, more challenges, more opportunities um, to drive more efficiency through our organization. So if I really just recap for me is um, I think we collectively have been ambitious we probably need to be even more ambitious and demanding on all of ourselves about how our expectations are around delivering ambition into reality. Um, that's clear, follow through. Don't say, don't take the initial no or reason, use five whys, any other lean techniques, etc. You know, there's a commonality throughout there. Um, be proactive, um, inquisitive um, through throughout there. And most importantly, let's share our ideas, share our success with pride. Um, we don't need every project to continue to, you know, reinvent the wheel, learn themselves hard. You know, that does gain, generate its own benefits, but let's share our collective um, successes and challenges um, and the strength of the team across our wider portfolio. On that point, um, I'm gonna pass back to Sophie. Perfect, thank you. And what a great recap on where we've come from to where we are now. I know there's so many more good examples out there that we could have talked about. So a massive thank you to everybody that is already involved in pushing it hard. Um, well done, Team Easton, so far. Let's keep it up. Uh, I think it is really, really easy to think, though, uh, that speed is just a network rail problem and it's for network rail to fix. Network rail absolutely has a huge role to play, but so too does everybody across the industry. So it was nice to be reminded. We are in it together and it's going to take everybody to change to really make this successful and to keep that investment going. So now we are going to have a chance to find out more about how the DFT are also tackling speed within their own organisation. So I'd like to introduce Cab Elethorn who will take us through some of the key activities that the DFT are up to. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so I'm Cavalli Thorne, a director in the DFT. Uh, I'm what known what is known as a senior responsible owner uh, for East West Rail and Middle Main Electrification. Uh, I've also be, played that role in the past for Trans Pennine Route Upgrade and East Coast Mainline. Um, and I've been very heavily involved in rail project speed. So if we sort of move on to the next slide, I thought it would be worth just recapping uh, what is the role of DFT in rail enhancements and then driving this efficiency. <clears throat> and fundamentally, we are sort of like to be the intelligent customer enhancements on behalf of ministers, uh, allowing them to decide the scope price schedule trade offs. Uh, it's our job to go away and secure the money so that this can be uh, the enhancement can be built. Um, and also to make sure we're getting the right degree of constructive challenge. So if we specify a journey time saving and an extra 10 seconds to meet the target is going to cost sort of tens of millions of pounds, uh, let's not do that. On the other hand, if a network rail engineer says, well, you weren't planning to do this, but if we just make this bit of a change here, we could add 10 seconds for a million pounds onto your specification. 
we want to talk about that as well. So it's about how do we get that joint good outcome um, for uh, enhancements, very much one team, as Paul said. That means we want to be collaborative partners, not just with network rail enhancements, obviously through our relationship with the train operators. Uh, we want to make sure we get that one cent one sense of one team. Uh, a good example of that will be on things like possessions, where particularly uh, in the post-COVID world, we've taken away some of the bad incentives in, in the possessions regime. And let's have some serious conversations about actually uh, closing a little bit earlier for night maintenance gives us a better productivity for doing some enhancements and things like that. Um, and so I, I see very much sort of two stages to our relationship, leaning in strong working relationships during the design and scoping phase till we get what it is agreed that we're going to seek. Uh, but then hopefully sort of lean back and empower our delivery partners to make stuff happen, but be there to unblock issues where we can help. And that can be particularly true uh, with things like uh, other bits of government, uh, so the Environment Agency, PINs uh, and places like that. So when I look at sort of project speed on the next slide, um, what is it that we've sort of really focused? Uh, well, as co-sponsors, we've been there sort of for sort of all the meetings about how do we drive this forwards, uh, chaired usually by myself and Rob McIntosh of Easton, but sitting across all of DFT and Network Rail. Um, we are uh, very much looking at how do we address system-wide concerns? So things that, um, uh, apply all over the place. Turnaround times with Natural England, for example, what are the incentives in the system that pull people in the wrong direction? I refer to possessions being one of those in the past. Uh, governance and speed of decision making is, is an important one. There are bits that sit within NR's control, there are bits that sit within DFT's control, and there are bits we can influence with Treasury uh, and other bits of government. Um, and sometimes there are wider policy issues that we need to address. We've also looked about our own capability and capacity. So very early on, we identified that transport worked out orders were just taking too long to get decisions out of DFT. Uh, we've looked at the process, uh, we've looked at the relationship with Network Rail, uh, but we've also increased resourcing so that we can turn these things around more quickly and now have service level agreements with Network Rail to get things done quicker. So no longer should a project plan for Network Rail assume a 12 month turnaround time for TWAO. Uh, we should be assuming three to six months uh, in the project plan. And indeed, uh, making sure that the risk of that is held by the department. So Network Rail is really clear, if it takes you more than six months, this is the cost of the programme and it gives us a better incentive. Uh, we have building our own capability amongst the, the sort of sponsors of projects uh, so that they have better tools to interrogate information, better training and continue to push the one team culture. Uh, we're also trying to ensure that we learn lessons across projects, so that can be how we specify things, uh, so a really good example that was somewhere between DFT and NR specifying things on the Oakhampton line, line speeds were over specified for the journey patterns, you know, trains were never going to get up to that speed given the stopping patterns, so why specify lines to, to that level of um, uh, performance. Um, and very much about how we speed up decisions, and I think there are fantastic examples of decisions being made within 24, 48 hours when necessary, uh, but there are also examples of things taking too long. Um, and I think it's just worth reflecting that there are, are generally three uh, reasons why decisions take too long. Some of them are entirely political. Government is still working out what it wants and how that fits in. And those are quite difficult decisions sometimes to land. Uh, there are decisions that take a while because, frankly, the analysis or the costing is just not good enough. And so we go back and challenge and say this feels too expensive for what we're getting. Um, and sometimes there's just a little bit of bureaucracy in the system. But by and large, my experience has been schemes with a strong political backing with a well-structured uh, business case and cost structure get through uh, governance pretty quickly and it's how to encourage all teams to learn from that. And finally I think there's a really important part uh, for the department to help the conversations around uncertainty and risk. Uh, that can be uncertainty about scope, uh, we don't know yet what it is, what can we do now, what do we leave to later, or it can be uncertainty around ground conditions. So an example I often give is uh, there may or may not be mines underneath a bit of work that needs to be done. If there are, it's going to cost 25 million. And if there aren't, it's going to cost 15 million. Um, let's have that conversation and let's not call it an average of 20 million because that doesn't help everybody. It's how do we uh, intellectually and rigorously draw that out more for decision makers? So as I reflect back on come, you know, about two years of project speed now, what, what are the things I think have struck me most? 
I think the first is uh, we did this experiment uh, with project teams. If you had a magic wand, what would you change to be faster? Uh, and it turned out that many more things were in the control of project teams uh, than they might have thought, or at least it was within their control to challenge. Uh, and that challenge could well be supported by senior leaders like Rob and Paul to drive change through the system if it was put in front of them, uh, or myself and my colleagues in the department if it was put in front of us. The second point that I think uh, is why the sort of one team approach was so important. It's amazing what happens when you get people in a room to problem solve whether it's DFT, network rail, the supply chain. Um, and usually my experience was if you do it for an hour and a bit, everyone's sort of taking their own positions, uh, do it for half a day or more, and people are really focused on the passenger and the outcome. And it's amazing what ideas crop up at that point to make things faster, different, and bring that innovation through. And I think the third thing I would say is there was just a recognition that there is poor data and poor sharing of best practice across the system. So fantastic examples in bits of the supply chain, network rail, DFT are doing things really well. They just were not business as usual. So a lot of the focus of the last sort of year in particular uh, has been how do we raise that game across the piece uh, to the, the very best that we see uh, happening in rail. Um, so I'm going to sort of pause there. Um, I'd, I'd be around for questions. Uh, and always open to uh, an email uh, or chat about things that uh, the supply chain thinks that we could do better as a system in the department uh, to drive better outcomes. But I think what colleagues should be uh, no illusion of, despite uh, some of the challenges we have, the government is still investing massively in enhancements in the rail system, roughly two billion pounds a year. Um, and it's our job to make sure we get as much as we can for that money. Uh, in terms of driving down efficiency and driving the right specifications for projects so we don't over specify them. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to Sophie. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Cav. Very interesting indeed to find out how speed is manifesting across DFT. And also beyond, there was uh, actually lots of new things in there that I wasn't aware of either. So it's fab to hear. And really useful too to see how those uh, different themes are linking across both of our organisations. So we're all doing slightly different things, but all working towards that same outcome. And it's always nice to see that you're open to welcome new challenges and new ideas as well. So it's a really, really positive message there. Thank you. Um, to move us forward now, we're going to have a little bit of a look in detail that's some of the key themes that are really, really making a difference. We're going to start with TRU, which has been dubbed the biggest programme that you've never heard of yet. So I don't think anyone's going to be able to say that in a few minutes time. But let's find out more from Alex Davis, head of the Consents and Environment in TRU, and Chris Wan, a programme manager, who's been working really, really hard on the access improvements. And we'll find out more from them after a really short video to tell you a little bit more about that massive program that no one's ever heard of. Across the region, we all share a bold, progressive vision that's built upon our strength and grit, our energy and ambition. Our industry unites as one to blaze a northern trail. The purpose to transform the future of Trans Pennine Rail. Connecting cities strung across these wild, majestic hills, a region famed for education, enterprise and skills. Our collective northern energies are harnessed once again, supporting these communities connected by the train, serving Manchester and Huddersfield and on to York and Leeds with the frequent, faster, more reliable trains this region needs. The Transpennine route upgrade holds this mission at its heart. And you, our colleagues, all will play your own integral part. From the dedicated engineers, undaunted by the weather, to the train crews and the station staff, we're all in this together. For sure, we will be tested on our journey to success. But when it's done, we know it will be worth it nonetheless. Electrifying lines, enabling greener trains to run, upgrading access, making stations fit for everyone, bringing jobs and opportunities for local skills and brains, benefiting the economies Transpennine Rail sustains, improving our service on each journey and commute, and bringing real change to the communities en route. 
investing billions in the very backbone of our nation for better rail across the region for a generation, delivering real change within the plans that we have laid on track to better thanks to the Trans Pennine Route Upgrade. Visit the trupgrade.co.uk. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Wan, and I'm the program manager responsible for the engineering access for the Trans Pennine Route Upgrade. Um, hopefully that video, if you're saying it's a, one of the, as Sophie said, a bit of a secret there, but yeah, hopefully that video gives a bit more of an insight to the size and sort of scale of the works that we're undertaking across the route between York and Manchester. And I'm here today to explain a bit about how we're using speed to have a positive impact on improving the access strategy. So we've really used speed as a catalyst to really push and challenge ourselves and the industry to find additional savings in this area. For the scale of the programme that Transpennine Route is, um, we're talking about thousands of possessions over this decade. So any savings that we can make, it really can have that really positive effect. And what we're looking at speed, obviously, from a financial point of view, um, any saving you know, can really be um, enhanced with that. So we've really had a concentrated effort to challenge the mindsets from the current industry norms and look at proposing alternative delivery, delivery strategies, which will in turn accelerate the TRU program. So to do this in practice this year, we've worked really closely with our Alliance partners, um, True East and, and True West, um, to challenge them to come up with alternatives, improvements, and on the graphic on the right, that sort of surmises some of the really high level um, elements and strategies that could be implemented again by working together. So looking at the, the biggest ones in particular, the ones that maybe draw your eye, they're looking at sort of a larger and longer blockade strategy, and they could have a real sizable impact uh, sort of in the region of uh, 150 million pounds. But like people have already articulated, if this was easy, um, this would already be implemented. So these ideas alone um, won't work. We need to really work, as that been mentioned several times already, that idea of that one team mentality. Um, working through and actually what is the best for industry position, you know, rather than what the industry norms are, what is that better position for us and actually what is the better position for passenger freight and the taxpayer. So to do this, we're working really closely with the Tox and Fox to understand how this increased access strategy, which is going to have a, more of an impact on, on the services, how that's going to impact them, be very clear about that and also investigate, investigating alternatives to how we can minimise that as well, you know, and bring them along the journey with us. And on top of that, making sure that with all these developments um, and a different strategy, it also brings potential risk. So making sure that the delivery can, you know, the alliances can deliver on what they say they're going to do. So to make sure that that is the case, we have an additional TRU access structure um, that is industry wide at sort of different levels. So we have practitioners, you know, um, with everyone from the, the route, from the TRU team and all the operators. And we also have that with the next level up with senior leaders in that up to director levels for the industry, including the DFT, to make sure that these options are assessed. The real impact is gone into the detail and the right selection, um, the right option is selected and the best for industry position is progressed. But it's not all about significant blockades. We are also looking at and have come up with quite a few alternatives or sort of re looked at the idea of how do we maximise midweek nights? Do we lengthen them? How do we look at increasing the frequency that we have with diversionary routes? How do we work with maintenance better to integrate some of the works? And again, looking at ourselves and how we're delivering, how do we maximise the delivery and utilisation of the access that we already have? So a quick example there is the um, True East Alliance just south of York Project One. We've done some real assessment and the idea of that production line methodology. How you know quickly do we take the possession, the work site? How efficient are we with the actual then work content we have in there since within there six nights a week? And how do we hand back? How do we maximise that work content while we don't overrun, but still make sure that we're not handing back too early? And we're also considering new technologies. We've been working with the Wales and Western business improvement managers to come up um, and with the possession app that they start to use to sort of safely and more quickly get on and off the track. 
So again, trying to make sure that we're looking at new technologies and what could be adapted, and hopefully that's going to come onto the Eastern route next year and TRU would look at trialing it. So again, sort of echoing what other people have already said, speed has been a real catalyst for the TRU access, really sort of challenging the norms that we've had to ensure that we dedicate the right time and resources, including the right people to make sure that we can change the strategy for uh, best for industry, best for taxpayer position, um, and, and make sure that whichever options that we select are, are deliverable. So hopefully that gives a little bit of an insight. Please feel free to contact myself for any questions and I will hand back over to Sophie. Fab, thank you. And can, if we flick onto the next slide, then we are in a great place for Alex to tell you more about the consent theme, which is something that's really, really close to my heart, actually, and we've been heavily involved in. I know Cav touched on it earlier on, but now's your chance to find out a little bit more. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, my name's Alex Davis, Head of Consent and Environment for TRU. Um, great that Paul and Cav have already mentioned Transform Works Act order. Um, so we'll just, just go into a bit more detail about what we've achieved under the project speed. So next slide, please. So Transform Works Act order is, is a very powerful instrument. It gives us powers to construct, build, sorry, construct, operate and maintain the railway. And it gives us certainty that we can deliver these fantastic railway projects. But one of the key issues we've had in the past is there's no statutory timescales. So it can take up to one year for a public inquiry, inspectors report six months plus, and the decision can be six months plus. So there's no certainty around the post application timescales. I think as Cav said, that can lead to increased risks and costs to the project. So our speed ask um, going back a number of years now was to give us increased level of certainty of those timescales. Most importantly, without legislation changes, so we were looking for a public inquiry max nine months from when we submitted, um, provide a decision within six months of public inquiry closing. So essentially three months for inspectors report and three months for a decision. So that was the speed ask. Um, next slide, please. So Huddersfield to West Town, hot on the, on the same day as Northumberland line. So two for the North in one day, um, we received our order. So Huddersfield to West Town unlocks the TRU programme, the programme you've never heard about. But essentially this is a upgrade of the railway between Huddersfield and um, Dewsbury and is for tracking through that route. And the speed timescales were realised. So from submitting our application in March, we achieved a public inquiry in November. The decision was issued in, in June 2020, June just gone. Um, and that was six months from inquiry closing so fantastic and how did that occur well through engagement creating advocacy for the scheme with the local population the local community consultation consultation high quality TWA application speed is no good without submitting a great application making sure we minimize objections and redress addressing those objections as well as having a compelling needs case so nobody can question the need for the scheme and just as important, our excellent sponsorship team engaging with our client, the DFT, to make sure we understand the need for the scheme, the benefits of receiving an order early, and also the engagement with the Transport Infrastructure Planning Unit to make sure they've got sufficient resources. So a great success story for, um, for the North here. Next slide, please. And just so the benefits of speed touched upon those, um, it provides increased levels of certainty of timescales. The TWA can be utilised more effectively as means to secure the consents. It's a one stop shop consent for the consents. You don't have to go back and seek additional consents. It gives us powers to acquire land and rights and also to acquire rights for maintenance access to improve performance and operation of the railway at the same time. It gives us increased level of certainty on receiving a decision, so reduced risks provides confidence on program and more effective planning and also means that we can rely on the powers in the past while waiting for the order we've had to go out and seek additional consents and acquire land outside of the order which can be costly and bring more risk to the program 
So the benefits of speed to our transport works act order have been huge and we look forward to uh, to the next submissions for TIU. Back to Sophie, thank you very much. Great stuff, thank you Chris and Alex. It's really fab to see all your hard work really paying off. So now before we move on, I must remind everyone to keep putting those questions into the chat. I can see they are starting to come in, but we've got lots of room for more. Maybe you'd like to quiz Cav about how progress is going in the DFT, or indeed ask Nikki Walsh a little bit more about the next topic, which is really how asset management are planning to change their approach in the future to maximise some of these efficiencies. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Sophie. So good morning, everybody. My name is Nikki Walsh and I am Head of Asset Management Strategy for Eastern Region. Could go to the next slide, please. So um, asset management, what is asset management? So asset management, the essence of it is about creating value for our assets and creating the maximum value for our assets. Um, most organisations start in a world of managing assets and doing good work around managing assets. That's focusing on service and cost. It's looking at age related sort of interventions, thinking strongly and getting good capabilities around maintenance, but generally quite reactive. Where we're sitting in a world that's changing and the world that's changing is bringing in more constraints, greater expectations, and we need to get smarter with that. And we need to start moving towards a, a stronger balance around asset management. And asset management is about taking knowledge, it's about taking insight and information and making good, robust decisions about our assets and the interventions we make. And as has been said already, um, you know, every pound that is spent and invested into the railway is a pound that could be spent elsewhere. So we have to make every one of those pounds matter. So for us, this is about starting to get proactive, to get sharper with what we do, and to think about not just today, but the longer term, being able to balance that intelligence, being able to take the better decisions. So for the world that we're looking at, we're looking at how do we do it differently? So as you all are aware, by the time you get to the delivery end of um, our investment world, there are less opportunities to make those efficiencies. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to get smarter at the front end. So if we move to the next slide, please. So this is really about, you know, in this constrained environment, in this world of greater expectations, in this world of less funding, we need to really start asking ourselves some really hard questions. Are we doing the right thing? So are we making the right choices, investing in the right assets and making the right solutions? Do we do it at the right time? Have we got the right skills and capabilities? And have we got the costs right? And this is all about being able to answer those questions through our planning processes and improving our planning processes to really become much more effective in delivering our customer outcomes. And that is really about coming back to that question around value. It's that value um, based thinking that we're wanting to move towards. But value is quite subjective and value really does depend on where you sit. So you can be sitting in a world of finance where value is about profit and loss. It's about cash. You could be sitting in a in a world of maintenance to the maintenance teams. Value is about the sustainability of the assets. It's about having the equipment to fix them. It's about the effort involved. The safety people value is around keeping people safe. It's around the well-being of our staff. It's about the safety of our customers. So all of these questions of value have different meanings to different people. And the other problem we've got is we are juggling that um, real dilemma at the moment of cash versus value. And there's a lot of people when we talk about MVP start thinking that that's cutting corners and it's about saving cash. It's not. It's about doing the right thing and creating the right value. If we move on to the next slide, please. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to get this really clear line of sight into everything we do against um, a, a wider variety of value. It's no longer good enough to just think of value being about money and about cash. We need to think about the broader concepts of value. We have ambitions to do um, great things in environmental sustainability. We want to give our customers a better service. We want to make sure people are well and have got, um, you know, good good well-being facilities around them. 
So what we're looking at is we're looking at bringing in a framework to look at value from different lenses and to start thinking about building our um, control period plans and our future investment plans structured around this value conversation. And actually what this really helps us do is it helps us get that line of sight between our corporate objectives and our bench and our um, scorecard categories. So you can see there if we talk about the different six types of value and six types of capital, you can see how they can align into the corporate objectives and the things that we're trying to achieve. And what we want to do is we want to equate every investment we make and look at how it contributes to each of those categories of value. And we want to be able to see our plans stacked up against that and make sure our plans are balanced to achieve the objectives that we want to achieve. So we want to start building plans that you can see how much we're investing in our people, how much are we investing in, in improving the environment, how much are we investing in intelligence and knowledge, as well as how much are we physically investing in our assets. So this is starting to get that clear line of sight between the outcomes we wish to achieve um, and the plans that we're trying to, to deliver. And we need to also accept that there are tangible values and intangible values. Some of this stuff is not very easy to quantify. So if we move to the next slide, please. So if you start thinking about the world that we're very, very familiar with, we're very familiar with a world that is very much output focus and output driven. So we, we, we talk about and we measure and we track how many kilometers of track have we renewed, how much digital signaling have we put in, how much fencing, how much overhead lines have we repaired or renewed. Those are outputs, those are easy to quantify, they're easy to measure and they're easy to cost. But we're starting to shift the balance towards outcomes and outcomes is starting to. So what are those actions actually doing? How are they improving our train performance? How are they improving our safety? Do they help our decarbonisation agenda? That is also reasonably easy to measure. It's getting a bit harder, but it's reasonably easy to measure and we can start putting some costs to it. What's starting to really push us hard is starting to think about value. So what's the value to society of the services that we give and the changes we make? How does it impact on customers trust and loyalty, the environmental benefits? This is more difficult to measure and that's why we're often driven by cash conversations rather than value conversations. If we move to the next slide please. So thinking about sort of the the relationship between value and how that relates to the stakeholders and the measures. So we have all sorts of interventions that we take to mitigate risk, to, to capitalise on opportunity, to create greater service, increase capabilities, and they come from all sorts of different drivers. They could come from the health of our assets, they might be coming obsolete. And so there are lots of reasons why we, we look to intervene on our assets to manage the risk. But each of those interventions creates some shape and form of value and that value um, has a different feeling or a different meaning to each of the different stakeholders that are in these relationships. So funders are looking for things like cash flow, balance sheet, good returns for their investment. Um, when you start looking at our customers, they're looking at how much does it cost to use the services, um, how, which, how good an experience is it, um, and you can keep going through the, each of those sort of, of cycles, the environment, how much are we improving the environment, um, etc. But what we're wanting to look at is we're wanting to look at what does that actually contribute to our value of, of the assets that we own and the service that we give. So generally, you know, the, the the funding conversations and the, the customer conversations can be quite quite straightforward because you can quantify financial value and even manufactured value quite easily. You know the difference we're making to the assets and um, the investment we're making in them. And that is generally easier to quantify. But as you start getting towards trying to quantify, so what's the actual benefit we're giving to the environment? How are we helping society? That's where it starts to get harder to quantify. But that's the challenge that we're trying to take now um, in improving our asset management processes. So if we go to the next one, please. 
Um, so where are we now? So what have we actually done um, in, in the asset management space? So to try and start putting this in place, we've set out a very clear policy um, about how we do asset management, focusing in on delivering minimum viable products, looking at value, understanding the um, additional value we get for every investment we make. We've set out some very clear um, strategic objectives from the um, asset management perspective around. So what does that actually mean? And this is starting to take you know, some quite big statements and putting some real smart objectives around them. We've looked at now putting all of our work banks together into a single consolidated environment. We're starting to look at getting a common conversation and currency around risk and therefore then moving to apply value. But bringing all the work banks together creates that ability for us to have good stakeholder conversations. We can see all the work that's going along particular lines of route. We can engage with, with you, the supply chain, and talk about the type of activities that are going to be coming over the next five years period. We can also look at, you know, access opportunities, efficiency opportunities, where things align, um, and that's going to give us a, a better impact at that front end of planning. And the next stage that we're moving on to is we're moving on to actually applying value into that work bank and into those activities that we're doing so we can start optimising to get the greatest value and the greatest return from our renewals. So we're currently at a stage where we've got a prototype. Um, it's not running permanently on um, our interventions yet for the renewal space, but that's what our intention is and we're continuing to develop that. Um, with the intention that by CP7, the start of CP7, that will now become part of how we how we define and identify our planning and activities, intervention activities. So if we go to the final slide. Um, so this is just a very quick overview um, of, of the sorts of things that we're looking to do. So, so the improvements that we're really looking to do is we're looking to get better at capturing and understanding our asset needs and the risks associated with our asset base, understanding those and getting much better at doing root cause analysis and understanding our real problems, making sure that when we do move into um, the capital delivery side of it, we, we're clearer on what we want, we've defined the requirements, we actually understand the root cause and we're fixing the true problems. But I think the biggest thing that's going to change with bringing in this approach is the end of this cycle, which is that delivering and tracking value. Because what we're expecting is we're expecting now that when we've got an intervention with a value associated with it, we're going to track it all the way through the project life cycle. And most importantly, look, did the project deliver that value and learn from that and start making sure that we're tracking value at every point? So, um, that's everything that I would like to say um, today, and I hope that that's generated a few thoughts and maybe some questions. And I guess my challenge challenge to you all um, is, is looking at that broad concept of value, thinking about what you do and thinking about how do we get the best value and the best return for every pound that we invest. Thank you, and I'll pass back to Sophie. Thanks, Nikki. I bet that will generate some good questions and I can see they're starting to come in thick and fast, but don't be shy. Please do put anything in that you would like to get answered today. As I say, if we can't do it today, we do commit to coming back to you on any of the questions that are put in there. So please do make the most of that opportunity. And, um, let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you want to have answered. Let us know what you're worrying about. Let us know where you see opportunities. So now, we're going to go to another video that touches on one of our trickiest challenges and how we are applying the speed to make a real difference across our access for all projects. While speed started as just an enhancements focused um, sort of change in mindset, we've been working really, really hard to try to embed that across our renewals portfolio as well. So hopefully this will be a little different for you now. And if we can just press play on that video, and we can find out an awful lot more. Hi, I'd like to talk about access projects across the eastern region. Access for all for AFA is a term used for a specific work bank. What I'd like to talk about is far more region. 
it includes the stairs, lifts, and other means of access at the stations across the eastern region. In this video, you'll hear from Never Rail colleagues and our supply chain partners about projects that have been delivered across the eastern region. You'll hear about the great innovation that's taken place, you'll hear about some completed projects, and around some of the challenges we have with cost control. Things like speed, minimum viable products, and pounds on the ground. That is the measure that shows how much of invested funds actually manifests in the physical infrastructure at the front line. Firstly, I'd like to reflect on the current position of the access projects. We all know how important it is and the benefits that access project brings to the station across the region. The portfolio, though, has seen project costs increase and programmes extend in recent times, which when combined with the current environment, really brings into question the viability of delivery. And we need to work even harder than ever to make sure the projects remain both commercially viable and desirable. There is lots of work embedded in reducing costs and even more work being put into reducing future costs. But our mission is clear. We must become more commercially viable if we're to maximise the opportunity before us of investment in the infrastructure. Welcome to North Alton Station in North Yorkshire on the East Coast Main Line, a station which has benefited from an Access for All project recently completed here, delivered by the Network Rail, Capital Delivery Eastern Team and Principal Contracts Buckinghams, along with other project partners. Let's take a look. Part of the CP60 Part for Transport Access for All programme, the project has been delivered for under £3 million and on time, despite challenges to the programme due to the pandemic and in particular supply issues of certain materials. One such example would be the lift cladding, which wasn't available when required. In order to protect the programme, a solution was devised to wrap the lift shaft in a via wrap material so that lift car install could commence as planned, without being delayed as a consequence of the cladding material delay. Another example of innovative working to protect the programme was the methodology employed to install the lift shaft steelwork on Platform 2. The original intention was to lift via crane the completed steelwork into position. However, due to the required isolations not being available when required, an alternative methodology was devised as the activity was time critical to the overall programme. This alternative methodology involves skating lift shaft steelwork into position. The solution was developed within a short time frame and delivered safely and successfully the desired outcome, keeping the project on track. The AFA project delivered efficiently under its £3 million authorised budget and with a contribution from the station facility operator, TPE, the project was able to deliver additional works outside the original project scope to benefit the station and its users. This included replacement fencing, additional surfacing and painting works, amongst other items to improve the station environment, a real example of putting passengers first. I'm delighted to announce we've just received authority to proceed to completion with our accessibility scheme at Biggleswade Station, 40 miles north of London on the East Coast Main Line. Through applying these speed initiatives, we have saved £2.3 million off the initial quoted cost, which represents a 30% saving on budget. We've realised programme savings too through efficient material delivery and taking line blocks more effectively to maximise our weeknight working. Working together as a streamlined capital delivery framework contractor and investment team has been much more efficient and we continue to realise these savings throughout the course of the project. We're really excited to deliver this scheme, providing real value for the people of Biggleswade, giving accessibility to the railway for some of those people who need it most and continuing to increase our railway family. I'd like to introduce you to our new legacy FRP footbridge. We've designed this to provide an alternative cost-effective solution to steel, whilst at the same time reducing the carbon footprint, improving safety and enhancing passenger experience. After offering our assistance to Network Rail for a 12-month innovation programme, we helped investigate the benefits of using FRP footbridges. The main driver was to investigate how the industry could improve on the current methods of replacing level crossings with the focus on discovering whether it was possible to design, fabricate and install a low cost, low maintenance FRP footbridge. As Tassica have extensive bridge refurbishment and fabrication experience, we were well placed to examine the entire concept, having already looked into alternatives. At the end of the programme, there were several concept designs and the real impetus to move forward by installing these into locations up and down the network. We decided to take our concept, the legacy footbridge, to the next level by investigating how we could help cut the costs and reduce carbon on access for all schemes. FRP not only offers 
a significant whole life cost saving, but also cuts carbon through the manufacturing process and by negating the need for full refurbishment every 25 years. In order to keep our carbon footprint as low as possible, we use 100% UK source material and manufacture the bridges at our own facility in Manchester. Whether it's cutting costs on expensive refurbishment or helping reduce passenger and freight disruption on the brand new FRP schemes, Tessica will be helping Network Rail achieve these goals by using the legacy footbridge. Story alongside Network Rail and Lincolnshire Council have recently completed the Subiets Lane footbridge scheme in Cleethorpes. The scheme comprised the installation for an access for all footbridge over a level crossing which was closed back in 2019. The bridge provides safe access for people to get from Subiets Lane over to the popular North Promenade. The project required planning permission and certain planning conditions such as piling time bound so it was crucial we achieved certain dates. As part of the speed initiative, we conducted design review meetings with the asset team from Network Rail and the local authority to ensure we had everyone's buy into the design at the same time to reduce timescales and to minimise further redesign work. This resulted in saving 10 days from standard review scales to a total of around four weeks overall on the design programme. By working with Network Rail, we managed to secure two disruptive opportunities, one to install the robust and another to install the steelwork, saving approximately two to three weeks on the overall construction programme. This created efficiencies as it enabled other works to be carried out earlier in the programme. I'm going to take you through some of the initiatives that are underway to help clearly identify our cost base where this can be improved and how we will deliver better value on future AFA schemes. Within Eastern Region, we have set up an AFA steering group, which aims to lead a relentless and groundbreaking shift in the cost and time required to develop, design and build access for all rail station solutions. Some of the main areas of focus for this group include the development of a unit cost model or parameter table for AFA solutions. This model, which has been supported by our supply chain partners, breaks a typical bridge solution into its constituent parts, with different models being developed for the different areas of the network. This will allow us to identify better where costs can be challenged and for project teams to justify the abnormal costs within their scheme, which are present due to the individual station environments. We are also creating a best practice guide for AFA schemes to assist project teams in developing future schemes, embedding lessons learned and prompting teams to challenge scope and requirements. We're engaging with existing and new suppliers to investigate and develop innovative products and solutions. And finally, we are working with the operators to develop the CP7 AFA Workbank, both clarifying requirements and looking for opportunities to innovate and package works together to deliver best value for money. What a great reminder that speed is for all schemes and everybody, big, small, complex, simple, north or south. We're all in it and we'll get results if we do it together. So moving us through our agenda now, it's time to find out more about what Capital Delivery Eastern have been doing and how they've been moving mountains to try and work more smartly with our supply chain. And to help us do that, we have our Eastern Capital Delivery Director himself, who many of us know and love. So over to you, Rob. Thank you for that incredibly kind introduction, Sophie. Uh, and so good morning, everybody. Um, so in terms of how is speed changing how we operate and how our supply oper suppliers operate? Well, I would talk about that to start with in terms of us trying to bring our suppliers closer to us in terms of what we're doing and doing that so that we can understand more about each other's challenges and hence begin to see the different environments through each other's lenses uh, and part of that within um, Eastern region has been to understand about what delivering capital investment looks like within a devolved model, which for many suppliers 
over the last five years is also a change in terms of how they might have operated previously and how their businesses might have evolved over the last five to ten years. If we can go to the next slide, one of the ways that um, I found it quite important with my team to talk to suppliers is to first of all talk a lot about the experiences and challenges that our customers are facing and where better place to start than that challenge than the train performance train service delivery graph which follows a curve very similar to what we see on the slide where for the last 15 years up until the devolution PPF program train performance delivery suffered a year on year decline for the 14 years since the passenger performance metric was created in 2007. So we knew as an industry to maintain passenger performance and to maintain train service delivery, we had to do something differently and we then hence devolved our railway, but we devolved it because we believed that actually a many number of the characteristics of delivering a reliable train service resided within the local geographies in which those train services were delivered. So we've really seen a big shift from a national organisation to a regional business. And there's a really important point there around what the capital delivery landscape looks like as we begin to serve uh, more customers locally and we, we work for funders who are thinking within the regions in which that investment is carried out. Really interestingly for capital delivery is what happened during COVID when passenger numbers reduced and train performance went through the roof ironically. But then as passengers have come back, what we have seen is that train performance has begun to um, hit what we might call a ceiling. And that goes to serve to prove a number of the hypotheses we've always had that we don't have enough capacity on our network in order to deliver a, a, a truly reliable train service when the network suffering from disruption. But of course, within a devolved model, we know that that capacity growth and the investment in the railways is going to be thinking much more regionally, much more locally, and therefore we can expect to work more closely with regional funders on investment that affects our business locally. If we could just move to the next slide, um, a graph. So the, there's, uh, I think you've gone too far forward there. Back a slide. All oh, right, OK, don't worry, there's one missing. So the, the next point I would talk about would be the profit and loss for the industry. So the revenue graph, um, which is probably something that none of us was talking about up until COVID struck the industry. And that is, of course, to say that the, um, the railway industry has always had costs above its revenue. But we heard from Paul McEwen earlier that the subsidy that the railway relies upon has now grown from traditionally four or five million annually to as much as 12 billion. And that is also beginning to affect the landscape in which investment is delivered and capital deployment is carried out. And one of the reasons that's important from our customers point of view is that even with uh, demand now being as high as 80% of the pre COVID levels, even 80%, that means that some of those business cases that we saw within our big enhancements, those business cases that traditionally we would always talk very confidently about a pound of investment within the railways would very quickly result in two pound fifties worth of economic growth fairly rapidly. But after that, those kind of business cases fall away quite quickly. And therefore, even though the demand is springing back, we need to think very differently about how we can remain attractive within a government and a macroeconomic landscape where the government will be trying to balance its book. So we have to think differently in order to stay attractive for investors. If we can just go forward to the next slide. So we know and we've spoke even before COVID about the cost pressures that affect infrastructure delivery within the UK and we've spoke all the way through control period six about the fact that in like for like terms costs have increased by 40 percent even when you take into account inflation compared to the end of CP4 the beginning of CP5 and within the overall cost increase we know that uh, our indirects or our white collar costs, which many people will know I talk about a lot, have doubled. And therefore, rather than being 20 to 25% of our overall costs, are now regularly at least 45%, and in many cases more. And we've talked in recent years about the pound in the ground metric being a really 
way to assess whether or not our uh, contract models are delivering the capital as effectively and as efficiently as what we wanted. But what the um, costs do show us is that actually it's the time related costs that are doing the damage. And we can see from the costs within our projects that a lot of the cost increase over the last five years has occurred within the first third and therefore it's happened um, before we get onto site. We can see that uh, that's the area where our project costs have suffered most increase. And therefore the answer has to be that working with our suppliers and using project speed, we have to shorten the cycles in which we deliver our projects. We have to shorten the engineering cycles and critically we have to shorten those cycles pre-site. What we know of our data is that 50% uh, of all of our projects that we develop, they incur um, that they reach their overall project stability in terms of cost time program within the first three months. So that is to say that 50% of the certainty is arrived at within the first 90 days. But then very often we spend another 24 months pre-site adding only 20 or 30% extra stability onto those scopes and specifications. And therefore, there's a need to be a lot more critically entrepreneurial about whether it's worth spending all that extra time pre-site investing in risks that actually we may well end up spending more mitigating the risk than we would were it to crystallise. Uh, next slide, please. So again, we've talked a lot about needing to look at the pre-site aspects and we've talked within Eastern about project speed being the uh, the what and our agile thin client model being the how very much working hand in hand in terms of the way we work with our suppliers reducing the amount of client side costs that we bring to the table in terms of how we client the work but also giving our supply chain permission to also work differently allowing them to bring less cost to the table and hence reducing the amount of money that we're investing in those pre-site cycles. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. And the next slide. So there's a couple of things in summary in terms of how we've been doing this and we've seen successes already with our supply chain in a number of these areas. But the first is to say that it has to be just true. It has to be true that we must reduce our client side costs. It's not reasonable that Network Rail, for every pound it gets given, it takes 30 pence of each pound and spends it on its own process and administration. And a lot of people ask me regularly if 30 pence is the wrong number, what's the right number? And I say to them, I don't know. I'm more motivated by just being clear that 30 pence can't be right. So Network Rail reducing its costs is what I would call one of our priorities that we've now done a lot of great work and I thank our supply chain for stepping into that space and working with us. One of the most compelling examples of why there was a case for change was that in the year that ended in April 2021, my, my part of the organisation received its biggest ever funding package from the government. We got one and a half billion pounds to spend on our railways, but only 800 million of the 1.5 billion flowed down to what we would call contract level so so benefiting the assets benefiting the infrastructure the other 700 million was spent uh, administering the spend for the 800 million so it cost us 700 million pounds to spend 800 million pound and that's just a great example of why the model needs to change and we need to work differently and think about how we work with our suppliers one of the first things that we needed to do through our agile client model was not just reduce our own costs, but critically give our supply chain permission to reduce theirs. And we know quite clearly that if Network Rail has a really large team, uh, then within that large team, we will create an administrative burden onto our suppliers that then have to resource up in order to meet that administrative burden. And we've seen examples time and time again, whereas if I have a thousand people within Network Rail asking my supply chain questions, the supply chain is faced with no choice but to then go and hire a thousand of its own people in order to answer those questions. So the first thing we've had to do is really think about how we thin ourselves down, but then also give our suppliers permission to also thin down. We also need to think very differently about 
those pre-site investment cycles? How do we get to site more quickly? And how do we make sure that when we are investing in risk mitigation through our design or our assurance that we aren't over investing in risks? And critically, we aren't spending two or three hundred thousand pounds creating a piece of design to mitigate a risk that were that risk to crystallize would only cost 20 or 30 thousand pounds. We did have examples of that and they're a real example of things that we need to kind of make sure that um, we remove from our system. We also know that the longer the pre-site development programs go on, so those programs with really, really long cycles of pre-site work and development, they're the programs that are most likely to get to the end of their development cycles and then have to carry out rework in order to get their costs back into a funding envelope. So we know that through the use of benchmarks and being very, very clear at the beginning about our design to cost ratios, that the use of benchmarks in order to decide what we do and don't build is, is quicker and more effective than doing long drawn out development cycles where we bring a lot of cost to the table pre-site. And I would thank our suppliers for, for the work that they've done with us because we've got lots and lots of successes now to demonstrate that this is the right thing to do. North Amberland line has been a great example, but there are many more. So in closing, I would just say a couple of things. The question I've been asked most over the last two or three years is what do we need to do to reduce a project cost by 20 or 30 million pounds? And the answer is actually quite a simple one. If we want to take those type of sums of money out of a project, then the answer is we need to do 20 million, 20 or 30 million pound less work. That's how we make those savings. So we need to be quite brave in terms of facing up to the work that we don't do, because actually it's it's not building stuff and it's not carrying, carrying out process that allows us to reduce the cycles and hence reduce the cost. So in closing, we're going to cut over now to a, a video of the Midland Main Line, but that's a really, really strong example of where the funders have said to us and the government have said to us they are interested in this investment, but only if the costs are right. So if we don't deliver the cost envelope in which the business case, well, they, they will not invest. So the gauntlet to the industry has been thrown to us in terms of the funding will only come if we can hit the costs and there's been some superb work with industry with our suppliers looking at how we introduce repeatability different products different techniques but importantly how we get ourselves comfortable by being more tolerant to risks that for a long time other railways in mainland europe have probably tolerated so this is also about how do we get comfortable tolerating risks that perhaps historically we would have spent a lot of money trying to design out. So with that, we'll cut over to the uh, Midland Mainline video. Surprise, it's me. Um, <laughs> right before we do cut over to Midland Mainline, I just wanted to just reiterate really, it's not been easy to change how we've been working. And people have been working really, really hard to do that, to keep plugging away. And we are starting to get there. So thank you very much to everybody involved for sticking with it. Got lots more to go at, but we really, really do appreciate how hard you've been working to get it done now. Rob, of course, is one of our panel panelists even in just a moment. So just to uh, give you one last chance to get those questions in, we will flick over now to the Midland Mainline video, where the team will tell us a bit more about the different ways that they found to embed speed that are really making a difference to them. Electrification is key for our infrastructure to support the decarbonisation programme um, and we need to reduce the single track kilometre costs um, where they currently are. BCC enables or is one of the items that enables a reduction in, in those costs to reduce civil interventions, to reduce track lowers and it's a huge opportunity for the industry to really look at decarbonisation.
so it's a project we, we're stuck in the middle really we're piggy in the middle we've got the the um we made a promise that we're going to deliver vcc but actually to deliver the promise we, we rely on persuading the designers to to come up with a a, a, a good interpretation of vcc max and we've got to get the root engineers have to sign off the design Being asked to implement VCC was challenging uh, because initially the route was unclear as to the risks it would expose us to. Um, VCC is a compromise. It, uh, it, would, it significantly reduces electrical clearances and the route needed to understand what the risks associated with that were. Uh, we worked through the project team and the TA, uh, so we became clear on um, the research that had been done, the science behind the technology uh, to enable us to be clearer and understand what we're letting ourselves in for. Given the choice, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do this, this way, really. You, you get everything sort of pre pre agreed, and all the standards issued, and and uh, a lot of the technical questions resolved. But the advantage of, of working through the Eptown in kind of a live situation under time pressure and and uh, with everybody watching us is is it it's kind of forced forced out. I think probably some some better solutions. You know, we've had very good engagement from the technical guys. We've had some pretty hot discussions between us and the technical guys and the and the the route there's been some significant unforeseen benefits of the implementation of vcc particularly given the interim state of the eptan um, we as an industry, particularly the supply chain and the, the route team, being able to influence that standard and you can imagine or expect that the standard when it does come out will be um, a lot more rounded in terms of its implementation. It, it's not quite a silver bullet, but um, it certainly is a tool in the toolbox. So this will enable future electrification schemes to use the lessons that the middle of mainline electrification has learnt to deliver more efficient electrification schemes in the future. Great stuff from the Middle Mainline team, and I hope it's useful to see that yes, things can change, even in standards world, where there's a strong reason to do so. So now it's that time already. We've got lots of great questions lined up and an equally great set of panelists. So I'll try to get through as many as I can, but just a reminder for any that I can't get through today, we will take them away and we will come back to you afterwards. So panelists, are you ready? Yes, and it's great to see that we've been joined by Rob Mack as well. Great to have you here, Rob. So we will get started. And the first question I've got is for Rob C, please. 
And the question is, is anything being done about the engineering assurance process? It is much more than just challenging the standards. So it's a very multifaceted question because um, at, at their very heart, these are engineering projects. They're not they're not finance projects. They're not healthcare projects. If we do everything we do is linked to the engineering. So but you know, let, let, let's start with some of the perceptions that people might have of, of network rail, and that would be that RAMs asset management communities often take steps to gold plate things, maybe that network rail has traditionally made it its business to man mark what the suppliers do, that product innovation is slow and it's hard to introduce technology, and that procurement is in itself a barrier in terms of making changes in those areas. And I think those perceptions in many cases have been fair and have been true. Um, but actually, you know, where are we in terms of the inroads into the changes that we absolutely need to make? Well, one of the things that we are collectively not very good at, and I would say that Network Rail and its supply chain jointly sit within this criticism. So we're not very good at cashing up the benefit associated with making some changes. So very often we point towards the type of thing that change, but then we don't really put a cash price tag around what, what benefit could arrive were we to make that change. And I think that that's an example of where we are beginning to see changes being made because we've been able to associate the cash and the size of the benefit that would come were we to make it. So I would say that there's, you know, middle and main line that we've just heard from is a great example of where we've linked the engineering assurance and the cost that that brings and the benefit that could come were we to uh, make changes. So I think that we need to keep doing what we're doing. We need to keep using project speed to point towards the cost prize that we could land upon were something to be done differently because we know that the regulator, we know that our SSB, we know that our technical authority will work with us if we can be specific and, and laser guided on the things that we need to change. And there's a business case to do it, in which case many there are there are business cases, but historically we can be a bit loose. So I think we need to continue the work we're doing. Middle and main line is a great reference point as to the changes that we can make. Uh, and, and but Northumberland line in terms of the, the, the way we've been approaching the authorization and the safety verification of the regulator completely game changing. We're talking about doing that with far less people in less than half the time. The regulators on board, but critically we used the cash benefit of doing that as a reason to create the momentum and the man mandate. So we can do it, but let's keep showing the business case associated with the changes, and I'm sure we'll continue to get the support to keep making them. Great. Thanks, Rob, for answering that so fully. I would like to direct my next question to Cav, please, in the first instance, and then perhaps, Paul, you might have a view as well. So the question is, what has been done to streamline governance and improve the speed of decision making? So over to you, Cav, first, please. Thank you. I'm going to come at this from two perspectives. I mean, the first one is we've done the best we can to take governance off the critical path, and that is by thinking about how we seek budgets, how we spend money, uh, how we really make strategic commitments to uh, the programme. So, for example, some of that means giving more, a bit more money earlier. So if we know we're going to do the programme, let's give the money for route clearance now. Let's not wait until final business case because we know that's going to happen. And one of the things we've been really clear about is uh, in, in DFT governance terms, you have outlined strategic business case, outlined business case, final business case. Outlined business case is the point where you're saying we've got a single option. This is what we want to do. Let's not make future governance on the critical path and slows things down. Um, the second thing is just bringing that conversation much earlier into project plans so we can see it coming up and we can plan. Uh, and if there's going to be a bit of delay, again, it doesn't keep things on the critical path. Um, and I think the third thing is really around how do we manage risk and communicate risk more clearly so that, again, we can delegate things back again. Uh, which I think goes back to Rob's point about how much time we spend up front analysing risk than saying it's an envelope we can afford, afford and this is not now a strategic decision, it's an operational management decision. Um, so those are things we've sort of been thinking about internally. Uh, we've also recently got some new delegations from Treasury that take some of the decisions off, the, uh, off Treasury and made back in the department uh, and that speeds up the process as well. 
But I think the final thing I would say is the thing that probably helps us get through governance most is really well managed project teams uh, with a clear joint understanding between sponsor uh, and the DFT and the network rail team of the decisions that needed to be made when. And by and large, we are doing a much better job at getting those done. There will always be examples where there are big strategic political decisions to make on a project uh, around scope and things like that. And sometimes those will inevitably take time as ministers and others have to get stakeholders agreed around um, a particular set of decisions. But the goal has really been where there are a, a low political challenges on that is to really make this as streamlined as possible from the point DF uh, Network Rail asks us some money uh, for a program or an agreed scope to the point we give it back again. Uh, I think we made some really good progress. There's more to do, uh, but probably the number one thing I would say is bringing more spend earlier approvals so that you can crack on with the support for projects rather than waiting for that and lengthening the time. Great, thank you, Kev. And Paul, did you have anything to add on that in terms of governance? Just waiting for it to transfer to anything in the house. Yep. Um, I mean, I just continuing Kev's reference there, I think we should also just start with the quality of the, the proposition and the proposal we take forward through our relevant governance, uh, joint governances. That, that, that is critical. Um, I would use the middle and main line as a reference point of good practice. Um, we have existing governance, but also we should take a risk based approach to how we work through that. Um, the middle and main line team with support um, sort of took a sort of earlier parallel um, overlapping governance and took something that would normally take up to nine months from start to end of the governance for approvals, financial authority and, and board approvals within Network Rail, took it through within three to four months. So we can use the existing governance uh, and make it much more efficient. Um, there are some tangible changes I think that have been made. I think Cavs made reference there that um, delighted that the um, the Department and Treasury have got some you know, new delegated authorities. The four routes across Eastern also have um, investment panels now that uh, for renewal purposes are much closer to the the investment um, asset management decision making so that should be a speedier uh, improvement in uh, investment um, and then finally I think there is um, other areas that we, we shouldn't just stop there we should be continuing to challenge and um, um, we, we've got to propose though a better governance uh, an alternative governance and I know again the Midlands teams have put forward uh, a set of proposals um, that they've shared with myself and our regional FD uh, finance director that we'll you know we'll consider and then look to sort of sponsor and coach those through 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 the Eastern and, and Network Rail if we can see that they are going to add more value from governance versus just the sake of governance. Back to you Sophie. Sophie, can I can I say something on governance on live? I've got the red box. I'm going to give it a go anyway, even yeah, if I'm talking to myself. So hello, hello everyone. Hear yeah. from me a bit more in a moment. Uh, three things I just want to say on on governance. First thing is I absolutely recognise there is opportunity to do something around the space. That there is opportunities to to make things slicker and better. I also I think we need to differentiate decision making from governance or at least understand what decisions we're talking to um, or talking about. There is a need for the industry to get much cleaner at decision making. There's a bit too too much syndication of things in order to get decisions, which kind of just adds time. Um, but as Paul just alluded to, yeah, I've not seen a project that's in good shape get stopped by governance. So a project that's in good shape, that understands where it's going, has got the right balance between ambition and understanding of its risks, have got, got their funding and they're progressing. I've also seen a number of projects who were not in good state and were not really getting the right balance between risk and ambition be stopped by governance and that's what governance is there to do. And that takes me to the last point. We, we do have a protracted <coughs> governance now, but we have a protracted governance now because of the problems 
we were responding to and that we couldn't do anything for the cost and time that we said we would. And the way back from that is by earning trust, by doing what we said we were going to do and the time we do it for the price that we said we would do it, being ambitious around the cost commitments we make and we'll start to row back from the governance we've got by developing that confidence and Cav just said where we've already had some small but very significant wins with Treasury with more delegated authority which shows we're going in the right direction how far we go in that is entirely within our gift but will always be dependent upon how much trust we earn by delivering what we said we would for the price we said we would. Thank you, thank you. Well, that was quite a meaty topic, that one. Um, but I think everyone certainly got a view on it, and I hope that was that was useful to everybody to to expand upon that a little bit more. Um, conscious that we have got a number of other questions as well. So let's dive in, and it would be Nikki answering this one, please. How are we engaging with other industries, not just highways and water, to learn how they deliver on projects and adopt new approaches and technologies in ours? Thank you, Sophie. Um, so there are a number of ways that we engage with other industries, um, obviously through academia and research and the work that um, other institutes, um, sorry, other um, academics are doing. Um, I think one of the biggest routes we've got is access through professional institutes and we, we connect in with a lot of the engineering institutes, uh, but also um, a really good place that we get a lot of intelligence from is the Institute of Asset Management which has all of the major infrastructure organisations on it, as well as, you know, all the consultancy elite in, in a lot of this space. Um, you know, we're, we're getting learning from nuclear, from defence, aviation. Um, so there's, there is lots of experience out there. And some of the stuff that we've been looking at that others are doing are things like types of contracts, um, looking at, you know, infrastructure as a service, data and information as a service. Um, digital asset management techniques. There's a lot of really clever stuff going on with remote con condition monitoring. Um, so we we are always looking outside. But I think the, the, the question that I would pose back to you um, as our supply chain is that you are also working with lots of different industries and lots of different organisations and will be experiencing um, new technologies, new procurement techniques, new contract methods. Um, and, and we're looking to learn from you as well. We want to know what you've experienced that's worked well, what you've experienced that hasn't worked well, because that is something that we want to hear, we want to learn from, and we can we can start looking and using and building upon that. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Nikki. The next question we've got is going to Rob C. So, ACE is active within the Anglia route where all delivery outputs are dispositioned to framework contractors. What benefits do they have to reduce cost as there is a perception that this will hit their profits? How are costings being assured? So it's a good question and um probably say three things. First thing is um, obviously Eastern is is in respect of the four routes that make it up, but the uh, the capital delivery team in Anglia before we delivered our agile client lean operating model was by far the largest by a good degree. So the amount of network rails funding that was being consumed just by network rail white collar cost within that particular geography would, would have been far greater than the other. So there was need to do something. There was need to act. So we have reduced our client side costs significantly within Anglia and we've moved through our client agile model working in a very different way with our suppliers in order to achieve that. And the absolute bottom line is that by creating that environment, we create a stronger opportunity for those framework suppliers that are working in Anglia to get alongside the funders and our asset managers to demonstrate what efficiency and value for money opportunities they can bring if indeed they can bring them because trade-offs around things like design trade-offs around access trade-offs around volumes those things we know bring cost sensitivities but very often it's the suppliers and our framework contractors that can best articulate to our funders what the moving parts are and what the opportunities are so the environment is for our supply chain uh, framework contractors to be able to articulate and voice how that value 
be best delivered. So lastly, the assurance mechan mechanisms are very much around the cost benchmark. So the speed KPIs where we've described in all areas what the to be costs should look like, and that then allows us to start making design decisions, trade offs around what things need to be true in order to deliver those cost outcomes. So if the speed KPIs have been delivered against, then we can say for sure that those costs are at their lowest order and that efficiency is being delivered. And then it falls within the responsibility of the framework contractors to look at what business decisions they can bring in order to really drive extra value through technology, through volume, through access. But having those arguments heard and being really, really clear with our funders about what the trade-offs are, the decisions is what that ACE environment is all about. Thanks, Rob. That's, it's really useful to have a view, certainly on um, all things ACE. And I know everyone's still working hard to actually just make that success and, and work it through, but some of those benefits are really starting to take place. But we've got a little way to go. Um, there is a question here that relates beyond capital delivery. And I'd really like to direct this one to Rob McIntosh, if that's OK. The question is, at the moment, this seems to be aimed more at capital delivery and within network rail. If speed's been going for two years, why hasn't it been rolled out further across the company? Capital delivery are not the only team who deliver projects. Um, so so by, by the virtue of the fact that question has been raised, we've quite not reached everywhere that, that we wanted to with speed. Um, but but be assured that speed is being rolled out across the whole company. And, and when, when we envisaged and started speed, it wasn't just about capital delivery. It was we've got colleagues from sponsorship. We've had colleagues from technical authority, colleagues from the department. And, and indeed, we've engaged with supply chain on, on many occasions. And in fact, this afternoon, we've got a challenge panel with a diverse group of people across the whole of the departments within within um, network rail. Uh, and I also update our ELT regularly on progress with speed. And we are in the process of just finalising how each of the network rail regions will report their progress on speed through the business review cycle with the chief executive. So, so we, we know there is more that we need to do to embed speed within the organisation and, and roll it out. And that's a big focus of what we're going to do for the remainder of 2022 and into 2023. Thanks, Rob. And Nikki, did you want to add anything as well from an asset management perspective? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to push it quite hard now across the engineering and asset management community. Um, but I would also say that, you know, we've been looking at how we do our planning approaches. You know, I was, I've talked earlier about value, um, but most importantly, and, and touching on something that, that Cav said was around risk. We've been working around how do we get a common language for risk? Um, and all of these are speed principles. Um, and all of these will help support the speed initiative. And these are conversations going on in the engineering and asset management community. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's about thinking differently and about acting differently. Um, and that's very much a lot of the conversation that's being had. There's a, there's a cultural shift about, you know, giving people the, the space and the encouragement to think and act differently. Um, and that has been ongoing for quite some time. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Really good to reiterate there that actually the expectation is that speed is not just for capital delivery, that speed is really for everybody across Eastern, but also across the company and across the industry as well. And I hope that's the clear message that you're hearing today uh, across everything that you have seen. So we've still got a little bit time, a little bit of time left for questions. We're going to extend it by an extra five minutes because we've got some lovely questions we want to get through. So next, I'm going to go over to Cav, please. And we've got a question about minimal viable product. 
So the question is, is the approach at odds with being outcomes focused? By definition, MVP doesn't consider that spending a little bit more might deliver disproportionately greater value. Now this might well be a perception thing. So Cav, over to you please for your point of view. Thank you. I, I absolutely think this is a perception question. Um, to me, minimal viable product is a thinking framework rather than the destination in and of itself. And I think it ties back to some of the other comments, uh, questions made about the trade off between high uh, long term cost or managing risk. Um, to me, the minimal viable product is a thought experiment that says, what could we get away with as the minimum? Uh, but absolutely, if there's a higher value product that doing a bit more gives you massive benefit, we should be doing it. So I think where what, what for me, one of the key things about project speed is been putting back the critical thinking into how we do projects, not just following process and asking ourselves, what is the right answer? What are the trade offs? So uh, I'm just briefly, I want to sort of touch on credits, the middle and mainline team. I see a lot of teams across NR and the culture and mindset they've brought to this at BCC has been amazing. I mean, they set themselves the big goal of let's not raise, raise a single bridge. Now, that might be the minimum viable product. It might not be quite viable, but it's that thought experiment that says, how do we get to the right place for this? That's really important. And then we can have a discussion around that. Um, and that's what minimum viable product is about. It's about challenging ourselves, say, do we really need that? Do we really need the other? But then let's make a sensible whole system decision. Let's not skimp on upfront capital if it triples maintenance costs. Let's not sort of do something s silly here if it makes life difficult for the train operator. But I think we've just missed that thinking in a lot of projects over the years. And minimal product is very much about bringing that back to the forefront and creating a mindset of leanness um, that some people remember from the BR days. So um, let's just sort of think about that. But yes, if you think there's a, a great value to be added, as I, as I gave an example earlier, if a couple of million pounds adds a massive time saving and it wasn't in the original spec, let's talk about it. Uh, so let's find the right thing to do for the railway, but let's not forget the right thing for the railway is to do things as cheap as possible so we can do more of them. Sophie, might I come in on minimum viable product? And it, 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 as Cav has articulated really well, it, it is about process or a framework, but for me, it's about the mindset of being responsible that you understand what the minimum viable product is and we responsibly understand there is a trade off between whole life, there's a trade off between operability, there's a trade off between capital cost and there's a trade off between affordability. And it's been really clear that you understand if you can get a sweet spot between those, knowing where it is, but if you can't get a sweet spot, we make a decision in a transparent way so that we can then understand the consequences we're living with. The the industry at the start of this current control period was was on the, the potential of having no viable product because the way we were going is we were specifying ourselves products that, that, that nobody could afford to do. And as Canvas just said that the minimum viable product is about making sure that taxpayers money goes as far as it can and we make those decisions consciously and openly. Um, and, and it will always be, there will always be tension in the decision. It's about making sure that that tension is in the healthy way for two very important stakeholders, the passengers whose benefits we're trying to realise and the taxpayer who's paying for a lot of it. Thanks. Thanks, Rob, and thank you to all the panellists. I'm afraid we have actually run out of time for live questions today, but as they say, anything that we haven't answered, we will take away and we will come back to you and we'll make that commitment. So um, please keep a lookout for that. Before we close today, we've got one final speaker. So I would like to hand over to Rob McIntosh to give us a few words on his feedback on speed and the journey so far. I th th thank you, Sophie. And, and before I just say a few words, I just want to say a big thank you to you, Sophie, for comparing today into the team in the background of pulled everything together. And of course, 
everyone who's on the call that's given up their time on the Friday morning to, to be part of this discussion. So th there's a few things I want to cover. The, the first thing is that as a reflection on a conversation I was having yesterday with a, a, a graduate who's been with me all, all week. I won't name her to embarrass her yet again this week, but I was reflecting on on when I was at that stage of my career and I joined an industry in, in the mid to late 90s that was that was being lined up for decline. Uh, and I was reflecting on how wind the clock on now to 2022 and we're in an industry that even despite the, the macroeconomic things that are going on around us, not to mention the political turmoil, um, is an industry that will grow. Rail is growing internationally rail is going to grow in the UK. It's going to grow because we've got a sustainability crisis the world and the country's got to respond to, but it's going to grow because the demand path is changing and, and, and that's a great place to be. But we are holding ourselves back because we've got to adapt so many different aspects of the industry to how the world is changing around us. And you know, we, we as we see passengers return and freight return post COVID, it's not what it was three years ago. The, the, the revenue income for the industry is changing. It, it, it frankly is just not going to be as profitable as it was. We're, the, the yield that we get will not be what it was. That means we're going to have to, as any good business, should adapt and change. That's difficult in our environment because our environment is very pit political. It's very public. You know, hence we've got some, let's say, some tensions with industrial relations at the moment, um, and and there's a lot a lot of things that are going to have to move on. Um, and, but what we've been doing at Speed in the last two years is absolutely the forefront for a lot of what we need to do in the industry. It's been about recognising what could be better, it's about moving quickly to change things. It's about making commitments that are both credible and ambitious and actually making commitments that start to win the confidence of the funders and the Treasury and starting to make commitments that win the confidence of our passengers and our freight users. So starting to committing to making things better for their experience. That's going to put us in a really, really good stead going forward. And we've got to continue that momentum. We've been at this for two years now. Cav and I are frankly bored of speaking to each other about it in the nicest possible way. Um, but but what I do think we've got an irresistible momentum about speed and where we're going with it as an industry but it's by no means embedded. And that's why one of my answers earlier about 22, 23 has got to be about embedding this. And in that, the most important aspect for me is, is mindset. And I've got, I just ask everyone to adopt the mindset of speed. We, we, we built it around the tool set, the skill set, but the mindset is the most powerful aspect and the bit that we've got furthest to go. The industry is going to reward the people that's going to display the mindset that are going to not allow governance to stand in the way. They're not going to allow product approvals to stand in the way. They're not going to allow you know, models with either the supply chain or models with 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 our own staff of standing in the way of good progress. Because I know over my experience over the years that, that actually mindset can overcome all of those problems and is the most powerful lever that we've got. So it would be those that adopt the right mindset that I think will be part of a very exciting future that we've got going forward. So just to kind of wrap up in time, you know, we, we, we've got to go much further with speed. We've got to keep up the level of ambition. We've got to deliver the macroeconomic stuff going around us now is different to what it was two years ago, but we know we're going to have to make each pound go just that even further now than we were thinking before. So it's never been more important. We've got great momentum. We've been making good progress. I want us to engage much more with the supply chain. I want us to get really, really closer. I really want to pull on the technology. I want to pull on SME engagement. But the mindset's the most important thing. And I think those who've got the right mindset are just going to have a brilliant and exciting future in rail. So I think I hand back to you now, Sophie, or do we close? I mean, I think that's quite a difficult act to follow, <laughs> so I'll keep it very, very brief. But just thank you, everybody, so much for coming. I really, really hope it was interesting. And again, thank you ever so much for all of the speakers today, too, and the panellists as well. 
I really hope that everybody learned something new. But most of all, I hope that it inspired you to get involved as well. So as Rob and everybody in the panel today have said, please work with us to make those positive changes. Please come and talk to us. Please share your ideas. We really, really do want to work together and actually make this a success. And most importantly, please give it a go. Thank you for your time.